Next up, we see Triple H and China come out and they bring out the returning Sean yes. Waltman. And, uh, oh, are we not allowed to say China? Why? I don't know. You said yes when I said it. Oh, because you mentioned Triple H's name, which just made me happy. Oh, hey, Hunter. Oh, he's not listening. He only watches. <laughs> they all listen. Uh, Ross referred to him as the kid on commentary. And he'd, of course, later go by X Pac, but he wanted six Pac. And apparently the WWF suing WCW for supposedly stealing characters and licenses created by Titan that were almost exactly the same name worked against them here. And they decide not to do that. So X-Pac is the name. He got a pretty strong shoot style promo on WCW here saying Hogan sucks and something like you better not stop short or Eric Bischoff would be so far up your ass. You know what you had for breakfast. And he insinuates that Hall and Nash are being held hostage or else they'd be right here with us. Uh, what did you plan of this script before it goes out there? Probably. I mean, I guess I should say without question, Sean Waltman's most famous promo ever. I'd say that a lot of it was written in conjunction with Vince Russo and Russo knew a lot of what he was going to say. The idea behind it was to be edgy, to be real, say those things that nobody expects you to say. And when Sean was coming in and we were trying to come up with names for him, uh, the reason JR referred to him as kid, because for a long time, that's was going to be his name coming back and just be the kid. And eventually they ended up on X Pac from DX and from six Pac. And that's how he came up with X Pac from there. But our working name with, with us was the kid. Uh, Meltzer would write Waltman fired three weeks earlier by WCW as a pawn in the tension between his friends, Hall and Nash and the WCW power base of Hogan and Bischoff agreed to terms about one week before his WWF debut for a four-year contract with a maximum of 15 working dates per month and a downside guarantee of 300 to 350,000 per year, a solid race, a solid raise from the 250 he'd been earning with WCW on a contract that still had about 18 months remaining. Apparently Waltman opened these negotiations with Jim Ross and Ed Kaufman at the WWF almost immediately after receiving his surprise FedEx termination sent by Nick Lambros of WCW to his house in Minneapolis, where he was at the time recuperating from a broken neck. The firing was such a spur of the moment deal that later that same evening, the announcers who weren't even aware of what was going on were still plugging him for public appearances for first day on sale dates that weekend. The original offer allegedly would have been a huge cut from his WCW salary and was only about half of the offer that they come back with. And that first offer sent a clear message to many in WCW that were unhappy about their positions that while they could jump and go to the WWF, they'd be guaranteed a lot less money and more dates to do so. Bischoff indicated to Nash he'd be willing to rehire Waltman but over that two week period after termination, not one member of the WCW office ever contacted him with the apparent belief that he needed to call them. Waltman was naturally bitter about the company and Bischoff in particular's treatment of him. Since this came on the heels of several months earlier where Bischoff had fired him and he'd been known to, uh, tease firings to get people's attention. And being told to sort of tone down his act with the crotch chopping and Bronco riding as WCW was trying to distance itself from the more vulgar WWF. His attorney at the time is Barry Bloom, and he still had a tenuous relationship with the WWF going back to the Jesse Ventura lawsuit. And he steered Waltman towards Elliot Pollock to handle the deal. And as time went on, the WWF drastically changed its offer and both sides came to an agreement on March 23rd. For a March 30th start. So he signed the contract the Monday before WrestleMania started the Monday after WrestleMania and Meltzer sort of freestyles that a lot of this may have been because he changed attorneys. Is that true? Did Vince sort of have a hard on for Barry Bloom during this time and was just going to be a bastard to deal with as a result? No. And Vince wasn't doing the dealing. It was Jim Ross and Barry was where Barry got himself in, into a predicament with the company was Barry represented P 
people on both sides. So like Barry represented Goldberg. Barry represented a lot of those guys, and he would work both sides against the middle. He was also representing Eric Bischoff at the time, I believe. So when you're representing the guy that's doing the hiring and you're representing the guys that he's hiring, it was a bit of a conflict of interest, and he and JR did not get along. He happens to be JR's agent now, just for the record, as well as Chris Jericho, Mick Foley's, and a few others. And through the years, we've actually had a pretty good relationship with Barry. But at this time, to say it was strained would probably be an understatement because of the tenuous situation with WCW. So Elliot Pollock was also uh, Brian Pillman's attorney. We had had some experience with Elliot but Elliot, we, we knew. I mean, everybody, it was it's an incestuous business, and everybody's cross-pollinating somewhere. So we knew everybody was talking, and the thing about it is there were guys, for example, The Rock, Stone Cold Steve Austin, a lot of guys that had their downside guarantees that were making five, six, seven times what their downside guarantee was. It becomes a mute point. However, for budgeting purposes and where it's going to be, your downside guarantee is what it is. And a lot of guys didn't understand that, that had been under the WCW guaranteed money, whether you work or not. And here it was, if you work, you make money. If you don't work, eh, you're not going to make a lot of money. In the main event, we see the New Age Outlaws beat Cactus Jack and Terry Funk in a cage to regain their tag team titles. But what we all remember is at the end, we see Triple H, X Pac, and China come out and attack Funk and Jack, and now a new DX is formed. Of course, famously, Triple H and Sean Waltman were already great friends and a part of the original clique, so it makes sense for them to be in the new DX. But why was it decided to put the Outlaws in? Allegedly, even Sean knew they were coming in. How did that come to be? And if you want the full story on the Outlaws, of course, that's available in the archives at somethingtowrestle.com. Well, the credit goes back to Shawn Michaels and goes back to Shawn Michaels from several months prior to this taking place where Shawn really wanted the Outlaws to be a part of DX. And he thought that, you know, they were young, they were a good tag team and thought they'd make a good fit with DX. So that seed had already been planted. Vince just didn't want to do anything until after WrestleMania you're losing Sean, and now DX all of a sudden has three new members in the Outlaws and X-Pac. So it was to make it new and reborn after Mania. Let me ask this. Is this the best version of DX to you where you've got the Outlaws, Waltman, China, and Hunter, or do you prefer the original Sean, Hunter, China? I think they both have their merit because the, and Pete, that's funny because people a lot of times forget about the original version of DX, which was really just four people. Yeah. If you can't read it rude, was, it's four people. Right. And, and to me, that was what changed everything in a lot of respects. And, and DX was red hot at the time and it was cutting edge. However, more people, I think witness this version of DX and kind of look at it as I guess the original DX. So I think they were both equally good and, and served their own purposes in their time. Raw did a 3.8 that night. And Nitro did a 4.2 the night after WrestleMania. You're on such a high. Are you somewhat disappointed that you don't win the ratings war? No, we're selling out and business is good. It's on the upswing and it was a matter of time. The ratings the ratings war because we were selling advertising People were recognizing what we were doing at that point. Vince was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to continue with my nose down. It didn't bother him as much. 